Hey everyone, I'm Paul, and I have something very special to show you today. You've always wanted to see a 3S GTE swapped RAV4. Well, I haven't done it, but Dylan has. So today we'll be checking out his RAV4 and see what modifications he's done to get the 3S GTE engine to work in this RAV4. Which generation 3S GTE engine is this? So this is a fifth gen, which is very similar to the fourth gen, but still slightly different, and it is not a USDM market engine. So you got this on eBay, am I right? Yeah, that's correct. eBay from an importer, they're all shady. Interesting, so did it come in like excellent condition, ready to go in, or what did you have to do? No, the typical importer spiel is that you get the actual item pictured and they never send you the actual item pictured. So this came missing a few parts that were pictured and it was a different engine entirely. No exhaust system was included, which is kind of standard, but this is the, the turbo is there. So downpipe back is all custom exhaust. Uh, you can get a downpipe from a couple companies that will bolt to this engine, but they're not typically made to go into a RAV4. So they would still need to be modified. Was the turbo in good condition? The turbo was in good shape, no issues with that and that is just a stock turbo and it came with the ecm um, what did you have to do with the wiring so wiring is the only thing i outsourced on this build i sent it to doug at wire gap which is he provides a great service uh, it helps this community out a lot and the mr2 community so if you were doing the swap i would absolutely recommend his stuff he does delete the immobilizer on the gen 5 whereas the gen 4 does not have an immobilizer so he deletes that at a little bit of an added fee and sends you a plug and play harness that basically all you have to do is wire up 12 volts power and ground and it'll start right up. So that makes it pretty cool. So what about the OBD2, right? It's, is it Japanese OBD in this? Yeah, so this is JOBD2 now. So I have a OBD reader that works with the Japanese protocol. So I can read codes on this, but if you live in a emissions area, that might not be the best option for you. So what about this intake setup? Uh, is the intake manifold different between like the fourth gen and the fifth gen 3S GTE? Yeah, so Toyota flip-flopped back and forth a bit on intake manifolds. So kind of alternating generations, they switched from a side feed to a center feed. So this fifth gen intake manifold is center feed and it is a little bit different than any of the other generations. Did this engine bolt up? I mean, it's a 3S block. So did it just bolt up to your normal engine mounts? Yeah, all the engine mounts are exactly the same. Three of them, three out of four are on the transmission. So this is a factory RAV4 transmission still. Long-term longevity, not too sure, but so far so good. And they're new mounts, polyurethane filled, since there's no aftermarket option for RAV4s. Otherwise, all bolts in. It's still the RAV4 flywheel, though I did have to bore out the bolt pattern slightly to a two millimeter larger bolt pattern of the 3S GT and the 3S FE. Other than that, it is a MR2 turbo clutch and just to the RAV4 transmission. Where did you get that? Did you just type in MR2 turbo or like? Yeah, so a lot of the parts are crossing over from the MR2, so you can get shift bushings and all these other parts from various MR2 companies that specialize in these swaps. Pretty standard clutch. It is a little bit heavier than the factory one. It has a heavier pole in it, but other than that, it drives like OEM. What engine is that clutch for? So that clutch kit is for the second gen 3S GT that comes in the turbo MR2s. But it's all the same bottom end as the earlier generations. All right, so it looks like you have the stock E250F manual transmission in here, which would have made your swap quite a bit easier because you don't have to deal with the axle shafts or gear ratios or any of that. Um, why did you keep the trans stock transmission? I kept the stock transmission and just because of cost mostly. It's pretty cost prohibitive now to get a 3S GT with a manual transmission. So I decided to go for it and see if it held up. So far, so good. So did it just bolt up to the 3S GTE engine? Yeah, every bolt hole lines right up. Everything bolts right up. Starter bolts right up. This is a very clean looking swap. All the engine bay components are still in the right place, and the only obvious thing that stands out is the big red air filter. Dylan went through the new engine and replaced all the seals to make sure he wouldn't have to pull the engine back out for a while.
This engine got a new head gasket, timing belt, oil pump seals, and some fresh purple paint on the valve cover to match the exterior of the car. This engine came from Japan and was probably abused at some point, then left to sit for at least a decade before it was shipped to the United States. You can't assume anything is good. Perhaps the hardest part of this swap is building the custom exhaust. You can't just buy a pipe that fits. Dylan started out by cutting out a flange that bolts onto the turbo. The CNC plasma cutter makes that a lot better and a lot easier. Dylan cut and welded the downpipe in several places to get it to the right shape and it fits nicely in the engine bay. The exhaust makes a 90 degree turn, then has to fit under the oil pan. Under the transfer case part of the transmission, it has to fit in the tight gap above the subframe. The pipe then follows the drive shaft to the back of the car. This is the full custom exhaust for the RAV4, not available anywhere. The problem with building an exhaust this way is it's hard to replicate. It's a little easier because you can copy the existing pipe, but all the cutting and welding still has to be done and isn't much faster the second time. Finally, since there isn't much clearance by the turbo, Dylan wrapped the exhaust in fiberglass to keep some of the heat away from other parts. Here's how it looks installed in the car. The downpipe is 3 inches in diameter and made of stainless steel. There is a high flow catalytic converter right after the subframe that tapers down to a 2.5 inch pipe going to the back of the car. Finally, there's a Flowmaster muffler back here. How does it sound? Let's find out. You get a bit more induction noise up front, with some cool turbo noises of course. Let's take a look at the cooling system. If I were to dumb it down a lot, this car has a turbo that forces more air into the engine. That means you can burn more gas, make more power, but generate more heat. This is a Celica GT4 two-row aluminum radiator from eBay. It's not very expensive, and it fits the RAV4 pretty well. The inlet at the bottom is in the right place, but the outlet at the top is slightly closer to the middle and the radiator is thicker than original. This car has a new replacement condenser mounted on stock brackets. It's moved forward about an inch with some spacers behind the brackets. Dylan made a new upper core support to make room for the new radiator and cooling fans. The radiator can come in and out without removing anything else and it makes more clearance for the upper radiator hose. The radiator has two 12-inch slimline electric fans mounted to a custom aluminum fan shroud. The shroud protects the fans and the fins on the radiator from the heat of the turbo. The turbo is also wrapped with a turbo blanket and fiberglass downpipe wrap to keep heat down in the engine bay. These are just eBay fans that came with the radiator. Dylan also wired the fan nearest to the turbo to be on all the time when the car is on to help push heat away from it. The coolant hoses from the heater core are the same length as original and go to the coolant pipe here. It looks similar to the one on the 3S FE. The upper radiator hose is longer because the radiator outlet is in a different place. If you use the stock radiator, you can use the stock upper radiator hose. The lower radiator hose is stock. How well does everything work when it's 100 degrees outside? So I can crank the AC maxed out and keep it cool until it's above 102 degrees. At that point, it starts to just get a little bit warm. So again, if you're in a colder climate, it wouldn't be a huge deal. But keeping the AC, I felt like I had to go to that GT4 radiator. Tell me about this strut brace. So this is the OEM option from Toyota strut brace that you could get, I believe, on the later 98 up RAV4s. And I just added this center bit here to strengthen it up a bit and just add a little bit of flair to it. I cut that piece out on my CNC plasma table and just welded it to the factory brace and repainted it. What did you do with the accessory brackets? So some of the brackets are, it's a mix and match. This is the factory RAV4 alternator and factory RAV4 air conditioning compressor. And it is some of the brackets from the 3SGTE air conditioning. 
and I believe this is the OEM RAV4 alternator bracket. Nice. All the pulley spacing is exactly the same, so you don't have to worry about that. There's just some little modifications and gotta hit some stuff with the grinder to make it fit. With the 3S GTE, you need a different fuel pump. It's located under this cover, under the back seat. You can get the fuel pump out from here, but you still have to drop the tank to add a fuel return line. This line just runs from the gas tank to the front of the car. Dylan used a quarter inch brake line tubing kit from Amazon. I also recommend using this style flaring tool. It's cheap and works really well. Don't buy this weird clamp one. It's trash and doesn't work. I have a video showing you how to make a brake line for the RAV4. Here you can see the fuel return line in the engine bay. The way this works is the main fuel pressure line goes from the fuel pump into the fuel rail. The fuel pressure regulator returns any extra gas back to the gas tank. The 3S GTE needs a higher volume fuel pump than the 3S FE, so Dylan used the Deutschworks 255 liter per hour fuel pump. The wiring and fuel hose connections are similar to stock, and Dylan says this pump is a little quieter than the Walbro pump. So this 5th gen 3S GTE engine, does it have a timing belt? Yes, so this is a timing belt engine still. It uses a lot of the same accessories as the 3S FE or 5S FE, but the timing belt itself and cam gears, obviously a dual overhead cam engine, and that stuff is gonna be different. So that is fifth gen specific and will need to come either from Japan directly or from a specializing website here in the US, such as Prime MR2. Does this have variable valve timing for the intake and exhaust? It is no variable valve timing at all. It's one of the last engines of that era that didn't have VVT in any way. So Interesting. it's just a standard cam gear on both sides. The 3S GE that also people swap in here, the non-turbo high horsepower version did come with VVT in the later gen. And this has coil packs, that's pretty nice. Um, are these easy to get? Yeah, so on the fifth gen 3S GT, these coil packs are shared with uh, the ZZ engines from third gen MR2s and Celicas and Matrix. So those are easy to get if they do go bad. If you went with a fourth gen, they're quite a bit tougher to get and it's not a direct swap. All right, so um, did you use the stock throttle cable on this? Yeah, this is the factory RAV4 cable. It's just rerouted a different direction and comes into a bracket that I modified and made here. That is part of the factory 3S FE bracket, just welded to work with the 3S GT valve cover. So this is the stock cruise control, am I right? Does that all still work? Yeah, the cruise control works as normal. It does occasionally get into boost and get a little rev happy, but it works just as well as most cars of this era. When you have boost, you don't have a vacuum, right? What about the brakes? Brakes have a check valve in there. So typically while you're in boost, you're not on the brakes. So by the time you get on the brakes, you have vacuum again coming back to it. So brakes function as normal. The one thing that I am not certain on is the diff lock. Yeah, so, that's it right here. So the, the diff lock is gonna be these two solenoids right here. And I've heard you can add like a vacuum reservoir or something like that with a check valve to make that work. Yeah. Or you can add like an electric vacuum pump. I'm, I'm guessing that if you're off-road and you're using a lot of boost, you're gonna have some trouble with the diff lock not staying locked perhaps? Yeah, that's definitely a potential. I haven't quite gotten to a point in off-road scenario where I need the diff lock or notice whether or not it's working as it should. Uh, where's this check valve for the booster? Is this something you added to it? No, so that's a factory safety system in the brakes. So there's usually a check valve that runs along this line here. This is your booster line. And it's usually in either in the hose itself or on the end fitting there. Sometimes it's visible, sometimes they actually build it into the hose, but it's okay. just a one-way valve for vacuum. I noticed on this car, the fuel vent line is disconnected. Normally this line goes to the charcoal canister. The charcoal canister saves fuel vapors and two solenoids control when those vapors get sent to the engine to be burned. Japanese emission standards don't require this and there isn't a way to connect the solenoids to the JDM computer, so Dylan just left the charcoal canister out. In Japan, EGR is also not required, so this engine does not have an exhaust gas recirculation valve. The 3S GTE still has a PCV valve. PCV stands for Positive Crankcase Ventilation. 
When the engine is running, there is always a little bit of pressure and gas that gets past the piston rings and the PCV system allows extra vapors to escape the inside of the engine. The vapors are routed to the intake manifold. So what happens to the PCV valve when you have pressure in the intake instead of vacuum? It's similar to the brakes, it's a one-way valve, so it can't push air back into the crankcase when the intake manifold is under boost. Have you thought about putting an oil catch can on this? I have, but I haven't had any issues with it recirculating oil into the intake. As I've pulled the intake off, I haven't seen any oil in there really, so it does seem to run pretty effectively. All right, how many oxygen sensors does this have? So this only has one wideband sensor, which is typical again of JDM emission standards. So that has the one oxygen sensor right there and that's it. I may add another wideband downstream a little bit in the future so I have a gauge in the car to tell me. That's interesting. So they don't do an O2 after the cat in Japan? No, it's just the one pre-cat typically right up by the turbo on these engines. They're usually pretty close to the exhaust manifold. What gauges did you add to the car? So the only gauge I've added so far is a boost gauge in this small center console bit that I've made. And that orange light, it's for a coolant over temp light. So I did add that as a dummy light because these cars don't have it. And it's fairly likely for this car to get warm, especially under hard use or track use. And I do intend on tracking this car. Did you make this aluminum piece? Yeah, I made that aluminum piece. I have a CNC plasma table, so it makes a lot of this stuff quite a bit easier and repeatable. So in the future, if I did want to sell them or anybody else wanted one, it'd be super easy to just hit print. While we're in here, I should mention a tack adapter was needed to make the tachometer work with the new engine. So the check engine light is on. What's wrong with your car? So the check engine light is on because this is a fifth gen, which was only hooked to an automatic transmission. So it still has an automatic transmission ECU. And because of that, it thinks it's hooked up to an automatic transmission and it thinks it's not doing its job. It's possible that it can be fixed with resistors being wired in to those circuits, but I haven't figured that out yet. And as far as I know, nobody quite has, but on other vehicles I've had that has been fixable with wiring in some resistors. Fourth gen could come auto or manual, which is kind of why that's a more popular swap. You can get a manual ECU that will run normally. The only other downside with running an automatic ECU in this is the idle when it's fully warmed up. It sits at about 500 RPM and it gets a bit lumpy with the air conditioning running. You set the wiring harness into dug at wire gap, but that doesn't take care of the check engine light because that's inside the ECU, right? Correct. This RAV4 also got the second generation rear disc brake upgrade. You can pick up backing plates and calipers from the junkyard, and they bolt right up. This also requires changing the parking brake cables. The first gen trailing arms are made out of cast iron and tend to rust out and break. The second generation has a stamped steel design that's a little better, and the ball joints are replaced with bushings for more stability. Another upgrade worth mentioning is polyurethane filled differential mounts. These old RAV4s get a clunk in the rear end from the rear diff mounts being broken or just too soft. Dylan filled them with 3M window weld, which works just fine. He also filled the front mounts on the rear diff to keep it from moving. This RAV4 got new engine mounts too. This is just an aftermarket replacement mount from Rock Auto, and the front transmission mount is just the stock one filled with polyurethane. The rear mount is hiding back here, and there is one more on the left side of the engine bay. Polyurethane bushings transfer a lot more noise and vibration from the engine through the car, so it's louder than with the stock rubber bushings. Polyurethane bushings are a lot stiffer and don't allow the engine to move and twist as much. This allows better power transfer through the drivetrain and less movement means the turbo won't hit the fans and the exhaust flex pipe won't break. Dylan also installed solid shifter bushings for the shifter cables. The rubber bushings wear out and make the shifter feel sloppy and loose. These are the Celica GT4 bushings. They're available from Torque Solutions. Don't buy the kit for the MR2. It won't fit. And I noticed this hood looks kind of interesting here. So first of all, this grill. Look at that. It's beautiful. How'd you do that? That's another thing I cranked out on my CNC plasma table. Just designed it and then hit print. And so that's 8th inch aluminum. That's an old Toyota logo. Everybody thinks it's a Pontiac logo, but it was the 70s truck logo. And so I made that and just something a little bit different than the factory grill. 
and I'll eventually do the headlight swap like Paul did on his. And then the hood, I was having, obviously I need airflow through the top mount intercooler. A lot of people would just go to a water to air intercooler and not mess with the hood, which is fine and it probably works better. But I like the idea of having a hood scoop. So this is a second gen RAV4 Sport hood scoop, which was fake on the RAV4 on the second gen, but I'm making it real on this one. So that'll be ducted through the intercooler and help keep the intake temps down. And then these vents just help keep exhaust or uh, keep engine bay temperature down and keep things a little bit cooler at idle when it's not light in the hot temperatures here in Salt Lake. Does that come in handy in 100 degree weather? Yeah, that's the only thing that lets me keep my air conditioning on. I didn't have those and it started to get warm sitting in a light with AC on, so as soon as I added those, it helped kind of get some hot air out of there. All right, so the big question is, why did you do this? So I always wanted a Celica GT4, but as they became legal in the US, prices just got out of hand. And so this is kind of the next closest thing, and it's a great daily driver, gets okay gas mileage, and you can kind of just rip around and have fun with it, and it takes you to a junkyard and throw an engine in the back. So it kind of does double duty as a fun daily and a little bit of a work vehicle. So how much did this cost? So obviously you go on eBay, you see an engine, say 2,500 bucks. You might want to be like, that's easy, that's cheap, but that's not the total cost, obviously. It's always gonna be more. Whatever you think it might be, just go ahead and double it, and that's probably closer. But, so engine, $2,700. Then you have all the peripherals, gaskets, seals, new clutch, getting the flywheel resurfaced, going with bushings, rebuilding steering rack, steering pump, all the stuff you want to do while you're in there. It, and it adds up, and if you're doing it all yourself, and in this case, I have a plasma table and can make my own exhaust and can make all these parts. The only thing I outsourced was the wiring. So that considered this swap to get this car swapped and on the road with all the stuff you want to do at the same time cost me about five to $6,000, not including the car. So even on the cheap end, like this car, get it for $1,200 with a blown engine, you're still talking close to $8,000 on the absolute cheapest. If you're outsourcing more of that work, getting more ex exhaust parts or a downpipe, it starts to add up really quick. And as soon as you have to pay someone else to do any labor, then your costs get astronomical. So that might take you out of the market of doing it yourself. If you're not the type of person that can do this work yourself or if you don't have the time for it. So that's when you end up replacing your time for spending money. Do you have a guess on how many hours it took? Yeah, I try and keep track of my hours on stuff like this, at least somewhat, so I have an idea. I think I probably have about 100 to 120 hours in doing the swap and getting it ready. But that also includes doing bushings and suspension and a bunch of other stuff that didn't necessarily have to be done to get this engine in there. So I would plan around 100 hours, but that's also 100 hours of somebody that is highly experienced in doing this type of stuff. So if it's your first time doing a build like this, it's a pretty straightforward swap and it all is bolt-in with some light modifications. And there is great resources out there to help you get there. So I encourage anybody to go out and do something if they really want to do it, but just be realistic with yourself and know what you're getting into. It might take you 200 hours. And if you're the type of person that can only do a day a week or a day a month of working on it, it might take you a long time. So how long from when you bought this car to when it's drivable, was it months? How long did it take you? So I bought the car and then it kind of sat for a little while just while I was deciding what to do. I couldn't decide if I wanted to just redo a 3SFE or do a new build, whatever. And it just came down to it when cost came into it. I was like, you know what? I want to do a 3S GT. I'm going to go for it. So by the time I hit buy on the engine to the time it was running on the road, for me was about three weeks. And that's a pretty quick time. That's I worked night and day. And I put that 100, 120 hours into it in about three weeks. Wow. So I get obsessive about stuff. That is actually very impressive. Uh, so with the 3 SCT, what would you say the biggest advantage from the 3 SFE? Obviously it's faster, but where does this car do better? Is it better on highway? Is it better off-road? What was your experience? I'd say it's better all around. The 3 SFE is just definitely a little anemic on power and they're great cars and they last forever and they're fun i'm sure you know you like driving your car but 
if you want something a little bit peppier, it's definitely the spicier version going with the 3 SGT. Better on the highway, you can pass no problem uphill, you can go 80 miles an hour on the mountain and get anywhere you need to go. The only shortcoming, and it's the same as the factory engine, is the gearing when you get on some really steep, slow off-road stuff. So that's when we come into the, the same issue everybody's gonna have with this. It can't be in boost, it's not making power below 3K. So unless I can go 20 miles an hour around about, if you're on some steep stuff, you hit the same issue. Have you had any ideas on how to make this better off-road? Yeah, and that's when it gets into some heavy fabrication where I'd be cutting the tunnel out and putting a different transmission and mounting the engine traditional longitudinal way. It might happen in the future, and if you wanted to see more builds like that, of my type of stuff, like heavy fabrication, might not be like a homegrown job, but feel free to go over to my channel at Budget Build Bureau on YouTube and check it out. So budget builds, what, what do you do? So the whole intention of my channel is to do stuff like this and do it on the cheap. So I try and do everything I can. I like to pick up skills and I like to pick up different hobbies and whatever else. So I'll do upholstery myself, I'll do fabrication, engine swaps, everything I can. If you enjoy that type of stuff, uh, I have all kinds of weird projects, uh, hacking stuff up and changing stuff around. What was the coolest project you've done recently besides this one, obviously? So recently I took a Volvo 240 wagon and turned it into a pickup truck, uh, kind of side-by-side -side style, and just took it out in the woods and started mobbing it and just all kinds of fun with that. And then I also had a Toyota Tacoma that was crashed and I put a independent rear suspension setup from a Nissan in it and then put an aluminum flatbed on the back. And that was kind of a little track truck with a flatbed on the back. So that was really fun too. That's pretty neat. What did, what did you end up doing with that? Uh, that stuff I end up selling. I usually end up selling stuff once the project phase is done. I get bored of stuff really quick and I just want to keep building stuff. So Let's see how this works on the road. So for the most part, like, it drives like a normal RAV, I think. Other than the intake noise is the main thing. Turbo noises. Yeah, you get significant turbo noise when, when you light off as well. So, how much boost can you get out of this? About 9 psi. So, part of that is the elevation here in Salt Lake. We're roughly, what, 4,500, 5,000 feet. So, I think I would probably hit around 10 or 11. And the fifth gen is known to hold around 14 stock before you have to build the bottom end. So I may up the boost a little bit more, but I'm also a little wary of the transmission. It's just deciding to see its end. Yeah, that would suck. Then you'd have to get a different transmission and mess with CV axles and all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, which basically drop the front subframe again if you got to do the transmission. So I've been trying to avoid that. So no hard launches. Nothing like that. It would be nice, but... No hard launches, he said. But we're making a video here. Let's do that again. It looks pretty fast, but can it beat my stock RAV4? Okay, so it looks like he's just driving away, but my RAV4 really is going as fast as possible right now. Let's do it again. In case you're wondering, all speed testing was done on a closed course on the moon. No traffic laws were broken that day. This is how bad my RAV4 is. I'm still not up to 60 yet.
Okay, there we go. And Dylan is way over there. I can barely see him. Thanks Dylan for showing me your RAV4. This 3S GTE build is amazing. One of the things that's always deterred me from doing this type of swap myself is not really knowing what to do. Fortunately, you've already figured it out. Yeah, and I'd like to get as much info on this out there as possible, but there's also tons of resources, Facebook groups for 3S GT swaps, MR2s, RAV4s, community out there is great, as well as traditional Toyota forums and RAV4 GTT, who is out of Canada and has done this years ago and put a lot of good information out there for people looking for it. So be sure to check that out for resources on this build. And also, if you want to see more builds like this or weird Toyota builds, be sure to check out my channel at Budget Build Bureau on YouTube and at Budget Build Bureau on Instagram. And I'll include all the relevant links in the video description below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.